right, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Carl. Uh, this is Ulf. Uh, today's topic is uh, complexity economics, uh, which is kind of a uh, relatively new framework for uh, economic studies. Uh, so the outline for today is the following. Uh, Ulf will start by talking a bit about traditional economics. Uh, he will also talk a bit about introduction to uh, complexity economics, so we can compare them. Uh, then I will talk a bit more into detail about the features uh, slash assumptions of the uh, complex approach. Uh, then we do some uh, examples and applications of the complex approach. Uh, we will talk about the sugar scale model. Uh, I will talk about, uh, which you probably all are familiar with by now, uh, the prisoner's dilemma. I will also quickly mention uh, something called the complexity, uh, the economic complexity index. Sorry. Uh, then we will also discuss uh, a little bit about some criticism that has been uh, raised uh, towards this approach, and uh, then we will finish off with a uh, summary. Right. Okay. So economics has been a topic of interest for quite some time. Uh, People have realized that if we can understand the underlying mechanisms of the economy on a local and global scale, then we can uh, use this knowledge to sort of enhance uh, average wealth uh, across the globe, help people out of poverty, and uh, increase uh, well, the prosperity of the human race. So one of the earliest thinkers was uh, Adam Smith, or uh, well, not earliest, but you guys know him uh, from the when the Industrial Revolution kicked off, uh, he wrote The Wealth of Nations in 1776, and uh, he was immediately accepted by the uh, scientific community, and uh, a lot of his ideas have become very central in economics uh, still to this day. So a central part of uh, his theory was this um, uh, demand and supply of different products, and that these uh, curves would uh, stabilize in a sort of equilibrium, and uh, at this point, the uh, price of a, a product would be decided on its value was the demand. And uh, a lot of uh, other economics have uh, kept building on these principles uh, until this day, and com uh, economics as a whole is very complex, and so in order to actually perform calculations and come up with results, uh, they've needed to uh, introduce more and more assumptions and this has led to quite a bit by now. Uh, there are some common ones. Uh, not all uh, models and theories will use all of them, but these are uh, commonly occurring. So most notably the equilibrium aspect of the uh, system, uh, but also that the people interacting in this economic system uh, are usually assumed to have infinite foresight. They'll sort of be able to um, uh, well, see into the future and figure out like is, is this a product that I want to buy or do I need this money uh, will I be able to spend it better at a later time uh, the agents or people are also very self-centered and uh, only interested in uh, their own gain of a sort of utilitarian uh, perspective uh, the prices in the economy are usually determined by auctioneering where every uh, person gets a say and Whoever is willing to offer the most amount of money for a product uh, decides the price. And uh, all the products are also usually commodities sold at a single price. Uh, there are no brands or different qualities or uh, preferences uh, within consumers for different uh, articles. Uh, also, companies a lot of time work 100% efficiently all the time. And if uh, something goes wrong, there's usually insurance. Uh, be purchased for it and there are no transaction costs and the list goes on and on. Uh, so a lot of uh, economics uh, or economists uh, have realized that we're starting to step a little bit too far away from reality and the results uh, that are gained uh, when you do these uh, analyses is they don't uh, usually uh, uh, line up with reality very well. So in the 1970s uh, Complexity science was on the rise, uh, and largely uh, the Santa Fe Institute, the study of 
complex economics uh, started to gain a little bit of traction. Um, uh, so what they realized is that the global economy is the most complex system created by man. We have seven something billion agents and uh, network interactions on a lot of scales, feedback loops, all that good stuff. So uh, they wanted to start uh, by looking at the system uh, from a different perspective without making these unrealistic assumptions. Uh, and one of the first uh, models that combined a lot of these thoughts was uh, in 1982, uh, an evolutionary theory of economic change by Nelson and Winter. And they merged the ideas of the economy as a system and evolution, and they combined this with a lot of computer simulations. Uh, so this was like evolution from an algorithmic perspective where you uh, differentiate uh, well, uh, the eight or the individuals, which in this case would be uh, businesses and products, and they're made up of their business strategies and such. And uh, you would differentiate uh, these, and then selection would occur uh, on a market level, where the uh, market decides what's good or bad, and then uh, amplify the ones that works. So over time, uh, the, the complexity of the system would arise from all this differentiation and such. And um, uh, a lot of people have started thinking in, in the same way, uh, and to this day, uh, complexity economics isn't uh, really a coherent, unified theory. It's more a lot of different uh, ideas, sort of under the same roof. Uh, it's a mix of computational economics, agent-based modeling, social dynamics, evolutionary economics, behavioral game theory, interaction economics, and so on. Uh, but they all sort of uh, have a lot of aspects that are similar to each other, which I told will tell you about. Uh, thank you. Um, right, this is some. Uh, this is kind of uh, features slash assumptions of the complex approach. Uh, <clears throat> first one you have there is uh, something we here call uh, dispersed interaction, and uh, by this we generally mean that we have a large number of uh, dispersed uh, heterogeneous agents which are interacting. And the actions of, uh, of a given agent, uh, calling X for example, uh, depends on, uh, on the neighbors of X, if you define some, good of, uh, some sort of topology. Uh, and it usually doesn't just depend on the latest action or the current action of the neighbors, it can be the last hundred actions or, or so on. Uh, and it can also depend on the anticipation that X has on the future actions of his neighbors, and so on. <coughs> Uh, number two here is no global controller. So, uh, yeah, instead the economics is uh, basically controlled by the uh, competition and coordination of, uh, of agents. Uh, I say coordination here because we don't neglect the possibility that uh, agents over time will start cooperating with each other and so on. Uh, also, as we've mentioned, uh, in traditional economics there is usually a, a kind of fictitious auctioneer assumed in the situation which you use. Uh, and this is not assumed here. Uh, number three here is cross-cutting hierarchical organization. Uh, what we mean here is, um, well, to start off, the economy has uh, kind of several layers of interaction. Uh, so, uh, so agents um, interact on one level, uh, which, uh, which sort of gives a emergency, which builds kind of up the next level of interactions and so on, and like a recursive uh, process which on the top level would give a kind of a macro uh, behavior which is the emergent behavior, behaviors. Uh, in this approach uh, we do not neglect that agents can interact on several years at once, uh, which uh, I think personally is a pretty reasonable assumption because uh, for example if we uh, consider the CEO of Google buying coffee, for example, in a coffee shop, that's a pretty low level interaction. Then he walks into his office and buys a company. That's a pretty high level interaction. So, so it's more like a network structure. Uh, <clears throat> ongoing adaptation, uh, of course, uh, pretty natural to assume. Uh, the agents have strategies and behaviors which can change over time. Most likely in the in a positive manner, so it goes better for the agent in the future. Uh, 
but we also allow agents to make mistakes with some uh, probability in most cases. And uh, the fifth one here, out of equilibrium dynamics, uh, we'll talk a bit about what equilibrium dynamics is. Uh, it's kind of a, uh, a, a result from the fourth one, I think, because if we have uh, changing strategies and behaviors in agents, uh, I mean, then uh, naturally new kind of uh, possibilities will arise on the market, which um, which of course would disrupt any equilibrium that we have previously, right? So we don't assume equilibrium. <clears throat> and from these five, you can kind of get a, uh, a, uh, a kind of macro level uh, economics that emerge on the, on the top level that I mentioned, uh, which is uh, follows them from the micro level behavior. Uh, oh yeah, time for some uh, examples and ones. Okay, so now we're going to look at the Sugarscape model, which was uh, built in 1995 by Epstein and Axtell. And what they wanted to do uh, was to, without making any crazy assumptions, they wanted to see what are the sort of minimum rules we need to apply to uh, be able to get uh, the sort of structure uh, that uh, one can see in an economy, trade and such. So uh, we've got this island full of agents. And in the top right and bottom left, there are two mountains called the sugar stockpiles. And all the agents, they wander around and uh, want to consume sugar to survive. Uh, otherwise, they will die. And each agent will have a uh, certain amount of vision around them and a certain metabolism, which is how much sugar they need to survive. Uh, and at each time step, they'll look around as far as they can see, find the biggest uh, unoccupied pile of sugar and go there and consume it. Uh, and then over time, sugar will be consumed, but uh, it will also grow back in, in proportion to uh, how much there was at the start. So, um, and oh yeah, and then they can sort of uh, save up excess sugar over time and build up their wealth. So, running this, um, nothing too crazy happens. The agents sort of wander around in the beginning. Uh, and they over time they make it to the mountains, uh, some of them will die out in the wasteland where there's not a lot of resources. Um, but what they saw was that the ones who end up rich, they're always the ones who get to the mountains first and uh, sort of get the best positions to uh, live in and, uh, and build up their savings. Uh, oh, and also uh, the tier between, or the, like the segregation between the rich and the poor will only over time. Uh, and then they have the ability for the agents to have offspring. Uh, so uh, their attributes of uh, vision and metabolism and also their savings will be passed on to their children. Uh, and adding this, they see that this, uh, this segregation or uh, the rate at which the uh, rich get richer just increases, uh, but also the average wealth across the system. So everyone's better off, but the rich are even richer. And then they add another resource, which is spice, uh, to orange piles. Uh, so now every agent needs both sugar and spice to survive. And they also add the ability for them to trade this resource with each other in a, in a close proximity. Uh, and they do this by bartering. So the price is determined by how much each agent values each resource. Uh, so then, the agents can no longer sit around on their mountains. They start to get up and move around and form small uh, clusters where trade happens and caravans back and forth and such. Uh, and once again, the, uh, the average wealth has increased, but the rich just get crazy rich, while the poor, uh, they're still percent like uh, relatively to the rich uh, in form. Uh, and they also have the notion of borrowing and lending which agents can do if they want to have a child, then you need a certain uh, stockpile built up in order for them to have a child. Uh, and what happens is uh, a lot of uh, borrowing and lending starts to occur, but also some agents will both be borrowing and lending back and forth and move around and act as sort of banks and such to uh, distribute wealth and come out of their own profit by doing this. So, uh, with this, they, uh, they feel they've captured a lot of 
the uh, dynamics in an economic system. Uh, and they sort of argue that it almost seems to be an inherent aspect that as you increase or increase the average wealth for everybody by adding mechanisms, it seems that the rich just keep on getting richer. Uh, and it's not like uh, out of a political uh, point of view that uh, the rich are exploiting the poor or that the poor are poor because they're uh, sort of lazy or bad. Because uh, a lot of times the, the poor, they'll have like high, uh, high vision and low metabolism and such, but they just were unlucky in the start and uh, ended up wandering this wasteland. So it doesn't go too well for them. Um, yeah, so this model, uh, as I said, it reproduces uh, a lot of the behavior uh, that's expected within an economic system. Uh, but also, very interestingly, if you perform traditional analysis of this model, you'll find a lot of abnormalities present uh, that you'll also find when you do traditional economic analysis of the real world, uh, such as violation of the law of first price. Uh, the price will fluctuate a lot uh, depending on where on this island you're trading. Uh, also, the inequality spread is a lot larger than you would get from a traditional point of view, and uh, the volumes of trade are also a lot larger than uh, the traditional analysis of the Okay. Thanks. Uh, so, the person's dilemma. Uh, I think we're all probably very, very familiar with the details of this now, so I won't go through them again. Uh, <coughs> But uh, yeah, so it's, uh, we imagine several agents playing the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, you place all the agents on kind of a grid, and they play against their neighbors. Uh, and they play an iterated version, uh, which allows the evolving strategies of agents. Uh, you probably recognize this kind of. It's from the simulation course that most of us took close term, I think. Um, on the left, you have the grid of agents. Uh, different uh, colors represent different strategies. And on the right, you have uh, the, uh, the population dynamics uh, over time. So the last time iteration is uh, what the grid is showing now. <coughs> and by uh, S7 here, for example, um, the blue line and the blue color here, uh, it, it's meant that uh, the strategies that incorporate with uh, your opponent uh, until you have uh, played seven times or until your opponent has uh, started to, to defect. Uh, I assume that you know what this means by now. Uh, so that's how it can look. Uh, so this is kind of a general framework for, for uh, when you want situations where agents compete with each other. Uh, and it's easily generalized to economic problems. Um, for example, when you have two vendors uh, who sell similar products, uh, like Coke and Pepsi, for example, then it might look something like this. Uh, and, well, defecting in this case would correspond to reducing the price uh, for Coke, for example. Uh, because then most, uh, many Pepsi drinkers would go over and buy Coke instead because it's cheaper. And Coke would probably profit from it because they have a larger volume. Uh, and Pepsi would uh, go to the ground, right? Uh, and both the de de defecting uh, would, of course, not uh, not increase the volume for any of them uh, if they reduced the uh, similarity, right? Uh, well, unless like Fanta drinkers go over and buy Coke or Pepsi, but we assume only Coke and Pepsi. Uh, so that's both defecting, and it's not good for anyone. Uh, and the last option is um, both cooperating, which is what we see in the world today, I think. Both keep a rather high price, so they make uh, big, big profit. Uh, yeah. <coughs> and also the economic uh, complexity index. <coughs> it's, um, it's basically a measure um, of the, uh, the production characteristics of the economic systems. Uh, it's often used to measure uh, countries and products. Uh, for example, you have uh, the top five uh, complex, uh, economically complex uh, countries in the world. Sweden is actually number four on this list. Uh, this is from Wikipedia, I think it's from 2011 or something. Uh, and Japan is the most complex, as you can see. Uh, it's uh, quite interesting. It's, um, it has a pretty simple mathematical definition to calculate. Uh, 
I won't go into detail of this, but what is done basically is that you form, uh, you form the, um, the matrix connecting uh, countries to their export products. And then you, uh, you transform, actually you project this matrix uh, to the country country plane. Uh, and after that you calculate the eigenvectors and uh, from this you can extract the, the ECI. And it turns out actually that this is a pretty predictive tool for economic growth. Um, there is something called the Atlas of Economic Complexity, which was published in uh, 2011. I don't remember now who published it. Uh, but it basically uh, it shows uh, statistics of the ECI for different countries uh, over time. And it turns out that it is actually a better predictor of how the GDP, uh, GDP sorry, per capita uh, will change uh, than the traditional measures that are used, such as competitiveness uh, and human capital, which is a measure of uh, how educated the people are, and so on. So, um, yeah, so it has some uh, predictive value. Uh, and this is, uh, this is the Swedish export tree map. Uh, it is from uh, MIT, the Harvard Economic Complexity Observatory. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know how to read this map, but uh, I think it looks pretty interesting. So, uh, yeah. <coughs> a little bit of criticism that has been raised uh, to this approach. Uh, there is a person called John Horgan, who is a journalist for the Scientific American. Uh, during 95 to 97, he published a series of articles uh, which um, directed pretty strong critics uh, uh, to this approach. <coughs> uh, he admitted basically that, uh, that you can see pretty interesting phenomena in, uh, in these simulations, uh, such as butterfly effects, fractals, artificial life, and so on. Uh, but it fails to describe the real world in a concrete, uh, and most importantly, a, a, a surprising or new way. And uh, then we have a nominated professor John Morgan Rosser at James Madison University, who kind of agreed with him to some extent, uh, and he stated that, uh, that the simulation has rather uh, confirmed behaviors that are observed in the real world now, uh, which I personally think it's uh, pretty interesting because that would mean basically that you can uh, use the simulation to, uh, uh, to predict future behavior, right? Uh, and during the, the, the later years, the approach has gained more traction. It is influencing the uh, mainstream economics uh, these days. Uh, it, uh, it's actually pretty commonly used when calculating uh, ECI, for example, and so on. So it's gaining more traction. Uh, yes, that's a bit of criticism. Uh, time for a summary of what we have done. <coughs> So these are sort of the, say, the main ideas that differentiates these two uh, viewpoints uh, in complexity economics. We have a dynamic nonlinear non equilibrium system, uh, which in traditional you usually uh, end up in an equilibrium over time. Uh, the agents in a uh, complexity model are usually individually modeled. They don't have complete information of what's going on globally, and uh, they're prone to make errors, whereas in uh, traditional models, they're usually all modeled collectively. They have this uh, omniscient uh, complete information uh, and they make some crazy advanced calculations a lot of time to figure out what's the optimal choice to make. Uh, in complexity models you have a network which uh, has explicit interactions between every agent. Um, in traditional models you usually have a uh, market which is where everyone goes to interact, and there's nothing in between individually. Um, there's also the emergence in the complexity models, where the macro economy sort of emerges from the micro behavior. And in a traditional point of view, you only have uh, two separate disciplines for these two uh, types of economics. Uh, and there's also the evolutionary process in the complexity economics, where uh, novelty and uh, order of, uh, or the growth uh, of order and complexity comes from uh, uh, evolution over time. 
Whereas in traditional economics, a lot of the time, uh, there's no mechanism for creating novelty or complexity. Okay, thanks for listening.